Public Research with Daniel Schwartz. Episode 1, Deep Dive on the Italian Election, with Jacobin Magazine Europe editor, David Broder. On her campaign poster, Giorgia Maloney looks reassuring. The leader of the extreme right-wing party, Brothers of Italy, has reason to smile. Her party is currently ahead in the polls and has been forecast to gain 25% of votes in the upcoming election. Our nation is a nation that needs a government that will build without cronyism. People without a boss. A government of people that don't owe anything to anyone. People who cannot be bought. Can you get us up to speed on what is the landscape going into the election? Well, in a way, it's true that the landscape has changed and there's a lot of change in who the main parties are. But then at the same time, in a, in a way, it's a, a, a shift within the already very strong Italian right between different parties. Uh, so in Italy, there's this coalition of the three right wing parties, one of which is Giorgio Milani's party, Fratelli d'Italia, which is leading the opinion polls which could get 25% plus in the selection. Then there's Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia, and obviously he's often compared to Donald Trump, who was Prime Minister in the 90s and 2000s. Then there's Matteo Salvini's party, the Lega, which is also an anti-immigrant party. And really the big shift we've seen in this election is that Fratelli d'Italia is sucking up votes from the other two right-wing parties. So it only got 2% of the vote in 2013, 4% in 2018, whereas now it looks like it's going to be the biggest party and that Milani, its leader, could be prime minister. So, so yeah, I mean, I think in in the recent decades, we've generally seen a decline of the kind of old working class left uh, and its replacement with a kind of liberal centre left that that, doesn't have the, the same kind of mass support that the old left did. Then on the other hand, this kind of radicalization on the right, of which Milani is the latest uh, beneficiary. Italy is notorious for how many governments they've had over the years. Recently, my understanding is the country has been run by what they call technocrats. Uh, Mm -hmm. So can you sort of briefly, because it is very complex, with the way the Italian politics works. Could you take the audience from Renzi up till now? Who's been running this country? Well, that's already a lot of changes. Um, Yes, I mean, Matteo Renzi was the uh, Democrat Party uh, prime minister from uh, 2014 to 2016. And, you know, the Democrat Party is basically a combination of the old Communist Party and then the old Christian Democrats who were a kind of centrist Christian party. And that party was created in 2007, 2008, and is explicitly modeled on the US Democrats. And even within that you know, movement from you know, a lot of the base of an old workers and communist party to becoming a, a liberal party more like the US Democrats, within that there were certain figures, including like Matteo Renzi, who wanted to make it even more a kind of like hawkish, neoliberal, centrist party. And he, uh, Renzi, in 2016, tried to change the constitution and uh, it failed. And, you know, this was a a big victory for the opposition at the time, which was led by the Five Star Movement, which was a very eclectic force, uh, which claimed to be sort of against parties, against political alliances, against ideology for direct, you know, online direct democracy. And this kind of thing. So in the context of the like austerity period, Five Star uh, expressed dissent with the the ruling parties, both the Democrats and, as I mentioned before, Berlusconi's Forte Italia, uh, who even had some governments together in the in in the early 2010s. And yeah, so, you know, the last election in 2018 basically brought to power a coalition of Five Star, which was the biggest party. And then the Lega, which is an anti-immigrant far-right party led by Matteo Salvini, that lasted about a year. And then there was an opposite coalition also involving Five Star with the Democrats this time. So, you know, Five Star said they were against ideology, against coalitions and so on. 
but actually the, they then made a series of alliances with basically opposite partners. So they were first with the far right Lega, then with the Democrats, and then in uh, 2021, a new government was formed, which was uh, led by Mario Draghi, who was a former uh, president of the European Central Bank. And Draghi's coalition included Five Star, the Democrats, but also Berlusconi and also the Lega. So it was a so-called national unity government created during the pandemic uh, in the name of helping distribute the European funds to um, to, you know, to cope with the effects of the pandemic and then to uh, stimulate uh, economic recovery. So, you know, the last uh, year and a half from the start of 2021 till this summer, we had uh, Draghi's government, which was very um, powerfully welcomed in international media. Uh, we had a lot of this kind of rhetoric of Super Mario coming to save the day, uh, that he was going to save Italy like he saved the euro during the uh, the crisis of the 2010s. And, you know, undou- undoubtedly there was a certain popular support for the government, but at the same time, it you know, its composition had nothing to do with elections. Like, it was just a, a general alliance of centre-right, centre-left, centre-right, far-right. And the only party that wasn't in the government was Giorgio Meloni's Fratelli d'Italia. So the advantage this gave her was that she basically monopolised the opposition. And the fact that there were no other major opposition parties also meant she could basically say she wanted to be a constructive opposition, that she agreed with a lot of what Draghi was doing, uh, but in practice devoting all her polemical fire against uh, the left, while also criticising the other right-wing parties for being in government together with the together with the left. So basically, what this created this this te- you know, this technocrat leading a general grand coalition government is that it gave Milani the argument like, you know, we, you know, we would never agree to go into power just because of this kind of backdoor agreement. We want Italians to elect us. Um, you know, Milani says that Italy's had left-wing governments for the last 10 years, which is a vast uh, exaggeration. But but what, what it feeds on is the fact that, you know, Italy has had a lot of these unusual alliances of centre-right and centre-right parties in government together or direct rule by by technocrats and so what she's able to say is you know these parties are afraid of the electorate uh, they don't want you to elect the government but Fratelli d'Italia uh, is hostile to these kind of arrangements and we represent you know this out, out, kind of outsider-ish uh, force for change so that's that's a lot of the kind of wave she's uh, riding on at the moment. Before we get into Maloney, who is a fascinating figure in her own right, I am truly uh, mystified to see the, what's become of Salvini, because for a lot of uh, casual observers of Italian politics who may have not paid attention that closely for a few years because of COVID and Ukraine, uh, it's been a surprise to see that this figure who people really thought was going to be the the figure that would lead the fully right wing government and i remember he if i remember correctly he dramatically sort of did this gambit of leaving the uh, coalition with five star uh, so what has become of Salvini? How did he blow it? And how did he open the way for uh, Maloney? Mm-hmm. Well, you're quite right that, you know, he he did seem only uh, in uh, three years ago um, to be very much the dominant force. So, you know, he was uh, in the European election in 2019. Uh, the Lega, his party, got over a third of the vote. Uh, and seemed to be uniting the right around it, whereas now Maloney is doing so instead. Um, I think though, if we take a step back and think about you know who the Lega are, like that was a party created at the end of the 1980s that basically wanted to be a party that separated uh, the north of Italy from the south, that separate off the wealthier regions, or at least give them like much broader autonomy and to keep their own taxes. Uh, and started out also as a quite free market party, but and was always, you know, throughout the 90s and 2000s, uh, a quite junior partner to Berlusconi within the centre right, uh, but which built up power bases in the northern regions, 
uh, which are very and the regions in Italy are very powerful because they control things like uh, the health service. So there's national health service and it's under the control of the regional governments. After Berlusconi was you know, finally convicted in 2013 and barred from holding elected office, uh, and also you know, in the context of the financial crisis and the fact that Forza Italia, his party, was, was in the government with uh, technocrats and with the centre-left, the Lega then, under Salvini's leadership, started to try and be something else, which was a kind of general all-Italian nationalist party it started running candidates in the southern regions for the first time it and became a bit more kind of like yeah like a, a party which sort which claimed to represent the entire right wing block so you know it had a lot of success in that in the late 2010s and particularly when Salvini was interior minister in 2018-19 uh, and you know, when immigration was like very much the central issue in Italian politics and as you kind of alluded to in your first question like the European politics in general were much more obsessed with the issue of refugees and immigration. In summer 2019 he quit the government and tried to force early elections basically to ram home his advantage you know he thought if he prompted elections he could win a majority and, and cement his role. To his surprise, the he failed to force elections because the other parties formed a coalition uh, instead. As I said, you know, five star the Democrats and so on. And basically, that kind of hurt his initial rep- uh, sort of reputation as a winner, and also started to hurt his leadership within the Lega. Um, not in the sense that there were like leadership challenges or viable other candidates. But then other forces in the party started to push back against some of what he'd done. So in particular, the regional governments, particularly in uh, Lombardy and Veneto, which are two of the richest regions in Italy, controlled by the Lega, they started pushing more their own agenda, which is for more autonomy from the rest of Italy to keep more of their own taxes. And the problem with that, of course, is you know if you have more tax kept in the richer regions, then that also means less for others. Um, at the same time, uh, the uh, you know the the pandemic um, also uh, in in um, sort of heightened the importance of the of the regional governments and of the health issue. Um, so I think like broadly though the decline of the Labour support in 2020 was quite slow, uh, but then when it was in the draggy government uh, from February 2021 onwards. Uh, I think it didn't make much of an impression, and also it's you know the fact of the European recovery f- funds coming in uh, to Italy also intensified the the battle within it in the sense within the Lega, in the sense that you know do the regional governments control with the Lega? Do they want more money off the European Union, or do they want Salvini to be grandstanding against immigrants? So you know what's the priority? So even now that the right wing parties are talking about who could be in the next government. You know, at the start of the campaign, Salvini said, I want to be interior minister again. Milani said, well, not so fast. And I think like within the Lega, there are there are uh, forces who who basically want a, a change of tack. But yeah, I mean, I think I think the the Milani is enjoying a, a sense of outsiderishness and difference and, you know, being a party that hasn't been tested in government at least for a decade or so uh, and you know if you look at who's voting for Fratelli d'Italia its electorate is very heavily drawn from the Lega like the, they have this very porous uh, sort of permeability between them uh, it's often easy to imagine that the far right does well because it's picking up disgruntled working class left-wing voters or whatever but actually the, the main phenomenon is that Lega voters are moving behind uh, Milani so we'll also have to see how uh, permanent that shift is what, what what's interesting about Italian politics is un, obviously unlike English politics from an American point of view is it's much more opaque. We you know most Americans don't speak the language, uh, so we sort of have to guess at, at at who the personalities are. So a lot of it's just visual, and for the audience's benefit, I mean Salvini, and tell me if I'm wrong. I assume you would know much better than me. He's very much, he's sort of a big guy, black hair. There's all these photos of him tanned at the beach with uh, women and uh, 
maybe uh, different mistresses. He's sort of this alpha male right wing figure. And so there's something very interesting about the alpha male who is supposed to be the leader, but sort of blows his shot. And now he's having to beg, I guess, uh, this uh, woman who run, who ironically this, and she's quite young, I, I believe like in her forties perhaps. And she ironically runs a party called the brothers of Italy. Um, mm-hmm. What is that dynamic been like, and and sort of how do these how do they differ on the issues? Well, I mean, at, at, at the level of you know the, the sort of personalities and their appearance, I mean, Salvini is very much someone who'd like you know when he was interior minister, when he was interior minister, would kind of strut about in police uniforms and like army stuff, or or even kind of like. Uh, um, sweatshirts and things which are made by a company called Pivert who is associated with Casa Pound who's like a fascist social center so like yeah I mean he has a, that very kind of like tough guy sort of co- you know t- top policeman in Italy kind of image he was trying to project and then certainly at a, a certain stage of the their relative development you know when Fratelli d'Italia was the much junior partner Meloni with Salvini would often uh, kind of appear as very like deferential to him and so on uh, but yeah, I mean, like now, um, you know, she's she's immensely uh, stronger. Um, she's also like shifted quite a lot in the sense that like she, um, if you look at only like four or five years ago, her media appearances, like extremely aggressive and shouty, losing her temper a lot um, and very like conspiracy theorist. In the 2010s, Fratelli d'Italia was much more defined by its need to compete with other small uh, groups from the neo-fascist tradition, so it was much more uh, explicit in its radicalism. So, for example, like uh, Meloni, up till about uh, three years ago, like repeatedly uh, spoke of great replacement theory, uh, ethnic substitution, uh, denouncing like Freemasons, this you know this kind of like conspiracy theorist uh, and views intended to appeal to a very identitarian and as ideologically zealous uh, base whereas now particularly the like i said like the, the the fact that she was the only opposition to the draggy government paradoxically made her m- more uh, moderate in her like tone and communication because the mere fact she was the only opposition gave her the space to do so so there's a lot of emphasis on how constructive she was how they didn't want to uh, you know explode uh, italy's relation to the european union uh, and uh, also, I mean, this kind of very strong emphasis on the fact she's a Christian and a mother and this kind of stuff. So uh, a little bit like um, Marine Le Pen in France, where, you know, you take this like party of fascist origin, but then you replace its identity just with the image of the leader, you know, the smiling woman on the poster. Um, but I mean, the, the, the political difference between the parties, uh, firstly, it's it's in fact not very a big difference uh, i think the one thing the one thing that has really divided them is that fratelli d'italia is much more determined to paint itself as a staunch ally of the european union and nato uh, and in fact you know even from the 1950s onwards the dominant trend in italian neo-fascism and the part and the party of which uh, Fratelli Italia is the heir, the Movimento Sociale Italiano (MSI). So that party, basically from the 50s, sought to portray itself as uh, the best ally of the United States in fighting communism. And to that end, it sought contacts with like U.S. Republicans and so on. Uh, and you know, for example, during the Nixon presidency, it called itself you know part of the silent majority. So I mean, I think when you know, certainly when I'm publishing on Jacobin, when we talk about, you know, Italian post-war politics, there's often this kind of, people, you know, people often reply to our articles going like, well, what about Operation Gladio? Basically, like, what, <laughs> what about the CIA who orchestrated <laughs> the events of Italian politics? And what's actually interesting is that if you look at the, like, um, propaganda of the MSI, the old neo-fascist party, they basically echo that idea in reverse. You know, they basically wanted the Americans to 
support. It's like their idea of how they would reach power without gaining genuine popularity is basically forcing some sort of US intervention on their behalf. We've never, we've never like quite happened. Like it was kind of like it's certainly a, like a latent possibility. Certainly there were you know, US intelligence agencies who were involved in uh, terrorist uh, groups and so on. But obviously like Italy didn't have a Chile style coup d'etat. Like, so but I'm saying all this really to say that basically MSI always hitched its uh, hopes on alliance with the US as an anti-communist party. Uh, and uh, you know, even now um, is very determined to insist that it's like the loyalist, most committed partner of NATO and so on. Uh, whereas Lega is a bit more um, like, I mean, basically Lega is soft, is much softer and more openly friendly with uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, even uh, signed a formal alliance with uh, United Russia, the main pro-Putin party in uh, 2017, I think, and is widely known to have received money from Russia. Whereas with Fratelli d'Italia, it's a bit harder to tell. Uh, yesterday, uh, Kurt Volker, who was the US ambassador to NATO, said that he thought that Fratelli d'Italia had money from Russia. But in any case, like Lega is you know, clearly has a friendly relationship. And also, you know, when there was the five star Lega government in 2018 19, it actually made Italy the first Western country involved in the Belt and Road Initiative of China, whereas uh, Fratelli d'Italia is, is, is viciously and ideologically anti Chinese and basically portrays China as if it's this like, you know, communist totalitarian uh, state. So, so yeah, so so that's that's one of the issues that divides them. Also, because of course the sanctions could have effects on you know like uh, or be perceived to have effects on like gas prices and so on. So that's one of the main splits that's possible to see already. So in a way, uh, and you spoke and I think uh, perfectly about the parallels between Maloney and Le Pen as these. Um, female figures of the far right trying to soften their image ahead of general elections. And uh, it's interesting because if you look at Salvini, it, it might look uh, from an outsider like he's sort of what happened to him w with the Ukraine war. Was it similar to what happened to Eric Zamor, where Zamor had, and for my audience, Zamor is this I guess some people call him the Tucker Carlson of France, and he ran for the uh, in the most recent French election. He was sort of surging for a while, right in the middle of the campaign. It sort of ruined the French campaign because it, it just dominated the the final weeks. Uh, Putin invades uh, Ukraine. And this decades of uh, Zamor just praising Putin sort of synced his campaign. And uh, in Salvini's case, it's almost worse because there are just tons of pictures of this guy wearing literal pictures with Putin's face on it, like like uh, T-shirts you would buy at a concert. Uh, and there was also a, a, a moment where he went to, if I'm correct, to give supplies to the Ukrainians on the EU border, where uh, a, a Ukrainian confronted him on camera about his connections to Putin. It certainly looked like an embarrassing moment. Um, well, yeah. Am I, I, am I assuming too, sorry, am I assuming too much or, or did the Ukraine war has that been also a factor in his decline? Mm, I mean, so I think the thing you mean is, is there was a thing where he went to the Polish border town with Ukraine. Yes. The Polish yeah. mayor of the town, I mean, the mayor of the town who is Polish because it's in Poland, yes. uh, gave him like a t he gave Salvini one of the T-shirts, which you mentioned, to embarrass him because he was like, this is the thing you wore praising Putin, right? It, exactly. Yes, I, I was yeah. mistaken. So. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think the um, I think it's a little hard to tell in the sense that, um, firstly, because the the polling we have suggests that the um, the voters of Fratelli d'Italia are actually more hostile to sanctions than the Lega's voters. 
which might seem paradoxical in the sense that you know, seemingly Fratelli d'Italia's leadership, at least, is more strongly on the Ukrainian side. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's like uh, the facts of the Ukraine war is like very embarrassing to um, Salvini, but I, I sometimes feel it's something that the center left um, uses to define its own like political values and, and view rather than something that necessarily um, shapes how right wing voters vote. And, and, and how I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, and how has Salvini responded to the war? Has he condemned Putin or is he still sort of restrained? Well, he condemned the invasion, but there was also the um, visit to try and you know talk like basically he tried to pose it as if he could be uh like as if he could somehow like you know engineer or negotiate a peace um which was you know implausible <laughs> in the extreme given yeah he's basically a, a, a fairly junior figure in in uh um yeah he's a fairly junior figure but uh so i think it was in um i think it was in june he visited moscow um but but you know part of that is also because you know the relation is embarrassing so he's trying to row it back uh and you know so part of the thing also was that the um the the russian embassy i think the russian embassy to italy paid for the flight to moscow which was a big deal as well so i think he's like handled it like extremely badly um but um yeah i mean as i said i'm not sure how much the voting change is actually driven by the war per se or by the uh, by the impression of incompetence or rather just because basically milani is the main figure on the right you know she took over the leadership of the right wing coalition in the polls last july and then as the election has drawn closer we've seen her lead extended so i mean for example like uh, there aren't like really like you know because Italy doesn't have an elected president, it doesn't have like uh, you know, US style debates among the leaders. And yet some of the coverage has basically portrayed a one on one contest between Milani as the leader of the right and then Enrico Letta as the leader of the center left. So I, I think this, you know, as the election has approached, there's an inevitable focus of support in either side uh, behind the main, you know, whoever's perceived as the main leader. I mean, I think even with the the French case, I'm not quite sure. I um, I mean, like if you look at Eric Zemmour, I mean, he had, I mean, famously, like you know, he, his campaign symbol was a big Z or Z. <laughs> you would say, of course. So, so you know, obviously that's a very bad look because <laughs> no one, you know, basically no one in Western European politics like actually defends the invasion. Uh, but you know, obviously there's various ways of kind of like you know, m not wanting to support Ukraine or like, you know, doubting the responsibility or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it has had a general effect on the European far right. In the in the European uh, Parliament, there are two different far right groups. One is called Identity and Democracy and includes both Salvini and Le Pen. The other one is called European Conservatives and Reformists. And that's the one with like Milani's party, with Vox in Spain, with the Sweden Democrats who just did very well in the election there. Uh, and broadly, and you know, so, so, uh, and also the Polish government, uh, law and justice is in the, the, the latter one, in the Milani one, European Conservatives. Milani is the president of this party. I, 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 I'm just curious because I, I just want to make sure because I really, because I don't speak Italian, I worry that I'm based a lot of this just on looks and I could be mistaken. But Salvini, uh, he he strikes me, I've told you before, it's sort of fratty. Uh, but who is intellectually, uh, I, I, am I wrong in that? Is he, would if I could understand Italian, would I be surprised that he's more knowledgeable or serious or? No, not at all. Okay. No, <laughs> very um, buffoonish and angry. Yeah. And yeah, fr fratty is a, is, is a way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, like, um, 
um, yeah, there was a, a very successful cartoon a couple of days ago, which was like um, Russian culture. Someone says to Giorgio Meloni, um, have you read the um, have you read uh, the novels of uh, Dostoevsky? And she said, yes, all of them. And they say, what about the idiot? And she says, oh, no, Salvini can barely read. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, like, I, I think I think it's also a little one thing I actually find a little strange in the election is that I think um, the way in which Milani's image has been whitewashed in international media as basically a kind of serious conservative politician who has some rough edges, whereas like I think Salvini is much more seen as like threatening and dangerous. I think I think like in uh, like the the you know if you take like the 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 leaders of Christian democracy at the level of European Union, if you look at the US State Department and certainly the US Republicans, um, Meloni is much favoured to Salvini, um, who's much more like erratic. Um, and, you know, I think that that's, a, that's an image that she has confected quite recently, but very successfully. I, I think indicative also is, is you know, like, um, Hillary Clinton said it would be a good thing for Meloni to be Prime Minister because whatever her politics, that's like opening doors for women. I think it's very hard to imagine that that Hillary Clinton would have said that about Marine Le Pen, who I think is much closer to to, to Salvini politically. Um, yeah, I mean, also though, I mean, like, although Salvini is very boorish, he's also actually probably less so than his predecessor as the Lega leader, who was um, Umberto Bossi who founded the party and led it throughout the 90s and 2000s uh, who was also who was very prone to like extremely aggressive and outlandish uh and provocations and like also like some very bizarre policies like um for instance that there should be like a preferential tax for uh northern italians who had emigrated but then who came home again uh, and this kind of thing, and also like v actually probably more explicitly racist even than than Salvini. Um, so um, so yeah, I mean I think uh, the the thing is also is like the general pitch of like you know like Italian TV programs that talk about politics, like the likelihood of it def of it descending into furious shouting, is like much more likely than is true in the United States or Britain and so on. So I think it's kind of a bit um, less surprising or frowned upon. So let's get into it. Um, who is Giorgia Maloney? Well, Giorgia Maloney is uh, someone who calls herself a conservative and who says she has uh, never been a fascist. Uh, and that she's an ordinary Christian mother, Christian Italian mother. Uh, yet she's also someone who joined a neo-fascist party, the MSI, uh, when she was 15 years old in 1992, uh, and who has spent her entire working life, more or less, uh, as a career politician for a party which is uh, overwhelmingly composed of fellow former members of the MSI, fellow uh, post-fascists, as they call themselves. Um, if, you know, her, her uh, career, I mean, she, um, she became a, a local councillor in Rome uh, in, uh, I think she was 21 years old, and she became Minister of Youth uh, when she was just working at the maths in my head. Uh, I think she was 30 or 31 when she became Minister of Youth in the last Berlusconi government. So she's actually been a minister before, but in a very junior role. And, um, and before that, let, why don't you tell the audience about a video clip I saw on your Twitter that a uh, pretty remarkable clip of her from the 1990s, if you could. Yeah, so um, as I said, she joined the MSI, this neo-fascist party, when she was 15. And then in uh, she, you know, she became one of the leaders of its, of its uh, youth wing, uh, Fronte della Gioventù, uh, uh, Youth Front. And also the other thing I, I will just say before we get to the clip is like she was involved in a section of the MSI, like a local branch at Coleopio, 
which is in, in Rome, which is like very known for its uh, like a very like uh, harsh and identitarian and basically fascist conception of what the Italian right is. Uh, and in 1986, when there was a general election, um, a which, you know, already in 94, the MSI had been in a government under Berlusconi for the first time. So in 1986, there was another general election and uh, a French uh, TV crew followed the MSI around in the campaign and it followed around Giorgio Meloni, who was 19. And uh, it's in the interview is, uh, they say, what do you think of Benito Mussolini? And she says he did uh, great things for Italy. And uh, unlike the politicians of the last 50 years, he, you know, he did it for the good of the country. So basically, you know, she claims never to have been a fascist, but you know, she praised Mussolini in a very overt way. Uh, in the 90s, the leader of the, the party, uh, MSI, uh, Gianfranco Fini, he changed the name to Alianza Nazionale, said that it was post-fascist, uh, distanced it from the old fascism in various ways, uh, you know, like more, you know, doing a lot of like big condemnations of the Holocaust. Uh, in 2003, he visited Israel. So there was a certain attempt to to make the party seem more like a normal conservative party and uh, to, to, to sort of de-radicalize it in a sense. But in reality, like the people were basically the same and a lot of them certainly just saw it as a marketing trick. Um, so Milani is, uh, you know, a, a, someone who comes from that uh, background. Um, I mean, a, a thing I'll say as well, though, is that a lot of the figures in Fratelli d'Italia are um, people who've been around since like the 70s, when in Italy there was like very intense political violence, uh, terrorist attacks, but also like just a kind of more low level sort of like beatings and, you know, a lot of militants would, be, would go around like armed, at least with knives. Um, so, and so in the neo-fascism of the, the 70s or 80s, perhaps like having a having battle scars, having been in prison, this kind of stuff might be seen as like a, to your credit, basically, it like shows that you're part of the struggle. And there's a, make a big deal of the martyrs, so called the, the young members, particularly, who were killed in this kind of stuff. Um, and then the, the kind of Milani, as I say, was a teenager in the 90s, like certainly that kind of violence had like died down a lot. But then the commemoration of the martyrs, the kind of victimhood, the belief that in the first post-war decades, fascism and, and the right, as they call themselves, were like repressed and, and spat upon. Uh, th that creates like a very strong sense of like victim culture. And they really feel like they are finally, uh, you know, they finally defeated communism. They are finally legitimate they can finally say like their truth. And so if you read like Meloni's memoir, it's really full of this kind of victimhood, like, oh, like we've been shut up, we've been silenced, we 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 just get called fascists all the time. But then at the same time, she actually does praise certain fascists and historical fascist leaders, like not, not like the regime as such, but like certainly like kind of post-war neo-fascists and also certain figures involved in the regime. Um, so, I mean, I think it was kind of telling, which, which was like a couple of weeks ago, uh, she uh, gave this kind of statement to international media where she kind of insisted that, well, you know, we're not a fascist party and that's just left-wing propaganda against us. But the actual terms in which she said that were very restrictive in their criticism of fascism. You know, basically she, basically she said, uh, fascism is consigned to history, meaning it's just a matter of the past, so we have no interest now. And also, well, we condemned the, the anti-Semitism of the regime and the Holocaust decades ago, which is true. But then it, it, it's kind of like, the, obviously, the problem with fascism is not limited to the Holocaust. And that kind of way of talking about it very easily lends itself to the idea that basically fascism was OK until 1938 and the alliance with Hitler. And then it started to go like really wrong. Which yeah, is so let's, yeah, so let's, let's stop there before we go into that further evolution of her career in the Brothers of Italy. Uh, because from an American perspective, I think the way that uh, this 
the Spanish right treats Franco and the Italian right treats Mussolini is much it's much more foreign than our understanding of you know German Germans and Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a lighter legacy of fascism. Uh, so the people in Italy that are sympathetic for Mussolini, are they at least publicly also pro Hitler or or is it you or is it usually oh I'm just pro Mussolini but, you know it, it, or or how is that? Well, I mean, there's there's different gradations. I mean, I, I would say that the ones who are like explicitly pro Hitler is like extremely minoritarian, like you know, not at all within the realm of like electoral politics. Uh, you know, there are only some people who say those things, and there are some like um, uh, neo-fascist subcultures and like football hooligan groups who sometimes say like pro-Nazi stuff. But I think it's a very small thing because basically like the most obvious way to redeem italian fascism is precisely to separate it from german nazism yeah so, so and and also i mean like so even like the um so you know like in the um you know, most historians would say that you know in 1943 basically the fascist leadership overthrew mussolini then Germany invaded and put him back in again. And that is what's called the Salo Republic. So most historians would say that the Salo Republic, headed by Mussolini, which existed from 43 to 45, uh, most people would say that's just like a Nazi puppet state with like very little like real autonomous existence of its own. Um, so that's you know the, very much the high phase of like mass deportations of Jews and uh, the Holocaust in Italy. Uh, and but it's also the period where like you know it was no longer allied to like the monarchy or the church um so, so the weird thing with that is that for neo-fascists this moment the the final period is like the real fascism it's like the 18 months when they were really revolutionary where they were really carrying out their plan and so like the msi created in 45 sorry, the MSI created in 46, was a party of veterans of this particular experience, the Solo Republic. Um, so they insist that that wasn't fake, that that was like a, um, there's kind of both the, this is like a fascist revolution, a, a pure version, but also that the commitment to it was a kind of pure patriotism because they fought for Italy against the Anglo-Americans, even basically knowing that they were going to lose. Um, so that 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 very much influences the kind of militant memory of that in like neo-fascist circles. This idea, which is like, you know, we weren't just German puppets. This was like a sublime act of of self-sacrificing patriotism. Um, but I think like in Fratelli d'Italia in general, and also a certain kind of like, you know, it's not just neo-fascist. The way that like Berlusconi or uh, say Vittorio Scarabi who's like a, an intellectual well he's an art critic who uh, is very uh, much associated with Berlusconi or uh, even Salvini it's like they don't really praise Mussolini or like defend it but they trivialize it in a very intense way um, uh, uh, an example of this is is the the attempt to put the Italian victims of, of Yugoslav partisans. Uh, so, you know, Italy invaded Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav resistance was basically successful. But then even after 45, like Yugoslav partisans killed many hundreds, if not right. thousands of Italians, right? So mostly like, you know, policemen, landowners, mm -hmm. fascist officials, this kind of stuff, but also like many uh, innocent civilians, yeah? So yeah. that involved a lot of like criminality and repression and you know stuff like you know uh, soldiers raping women and you know obviously things which like should in themselves be like you know properly understood by historians and, and condemned and so on but then at the same time it, it's in italy it's kind of as if like these events and like the holocaust are basically like equivalent mm. so 
so there was a day of memory created for the Holocaust in uh, 2001, uh, which is on the 25th of January, which is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Then four years later, Berlusconi's government, at the instigation of a neo-fascist MP, uh, introduced a day of memory for these victims of Yugoslav partisans, which is on 10th of February, so like two weeks mm. later. And basically, these are very often, um, like by like local councils and stuff, very often commemorated as like one event. Like mm. the, we remember the victims of the Holocaust and of the Yugoslav partisans. Fratelli d'Italia want to change the constitution so that the existing ban on Holocaust denial would be extended to this Yugoslav wow. partisan. Right. So it's sort and, of, and so it's sort of, yeah. Memorial Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so Salvini said on the Memorial Day in 2019, in two separate appearances, he said there's no Serie A and Serie B victim, like the Italian Football League, Serie A, Serie B, are the different like uh, leagues, yeah? So he said, wow. like, you know, a child killed at Auschwitz and, in the, and by Yugoslav partisans, it's like the same thing. I said, well, yeah, but like, obviously, the number of children killed by Yugoslav partisans is two children, whereas the number of children who died at Auschwitz is like 400,000. So wow. the thing not really comparable at all and even so it's sort of it's sort of like the jews were victims but we were victims too yeah uh, yes and, and also because this is very frequently posed and not only by far-right politicians uh, this is you know very widely portrayed as like ethnic cleansing like italians were ethnically cleansed and so for telling d'italia when they talk about great replacement theory and about george soros and so on they often actually resort to this metaphor, which is like there was ethnic cleansing in 1945 by Yugoslavia, and now there is ethnic cleansing because it, Italians and Europeans are being replaced by Muslims. So this, they have this very intense, so it's not like they're like celebrating the glorious fascist regime and its expansionism, but then they have an extremely fascist indulgent vision of history which just turns the fascists into victims and in fact some of the leading kind of poster boys and girls of the victims were themselves uh, fascists and and one of the things that i think uh, a lot of americans don't know and is one of those and obviously mussolini and hitler were by no means carbon copies uh the jews of italy did not suffer the same type of uh, victimization, immediate victimization and uh, marginalization as the Jews of Italy and Poland did. Um, but what's sort of darkly funny about Italy is, of course, Hitler didn't have any children, uh, but Mussolini, I believe, did. So there's literally Mussolini's, are they still on TV? I know there's like, they're mm -hmm. celebrities. Right. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I mean, to clarify, I mean, like, of course, it's true that the fascist regime from the beginning in Italy didn't from the beginning impose uh, racial uh, segregation against Jews. But oh, it, for sure. Yeah. It did so without, it's like, it wasn't like old Germany, like, forced it to or something. And then, yeah. yeah. And also, of course, like, the, the racism also isn't only against Jews because, you know, like, yeah. from, you know, against, like, uh, black people and uh, yes. and um, Roma people and so on as well. So, um, but, but, but um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, Mussolini's, I mean, in my book, which I will now plug, my forthcoming book is called Mussolini's Grandchildren. Uh, so, of course, it's like, you know, in a way, it's like, you know, uh, not, uh, metaphorical because I'm saying they're the heirs to the tradition, uh, are, are, you know, in Fratelli d'Italia and so on, but also there are like literal relatives of, of, of Mussolini who are uh, still politically active. So there's um, Alessandra Mussolini, it's probably the most famous. So she was an MSI leader, this neo-fascist party in the 90s. She ran for mayor of Naples in 1993 and almost won. Then she was uh, uh, in parliament and she, um, she actually quit the party in 2003 when, as I said, the leader Gianfranco Fini went to Israel and condemned uh, Mussolini. So Alessandra Mussolini then quit. Uh, and had her own party, but then you know she spent some some years as well as uh, as an MP for Berlusconi's party. But basically, she withdrew from politics in 2019. But she's also someone who like it's like the fact that she was in Berlusconi's party rather than the neo-fascist party 
didn't at all like stop her from like you know defending her grandfather's memory and like you know condemning journalists who filmed the tomb and this kind of stuff um so then uh alessandra mussolini is the daughter of uh romano mussolini who was uh benito's youngest son romano mussolini was a jazz pianist and had basically no involvement in politics uh but uh so yeah one of his daughters was alessandra and then her half sister uh, also uh, romano's uh, daughter uh Raquele mussolini is a a, a local councillor for fratelli d'italia in rome and actually in the uh in, sorry, in the uh, rome municipal election in uh october 2021 uh, Raquele Mussolini was the single most voted candidate for like the Rome City Hall. So it's like, in a way, she's just like a local councillor, but then uh, at the same time, she's like quite famous and in the public eye also because of her surname. Uh, then also uh, her second cousin, who's a great grandson of Mussolini, is of Benito Mussolini, is called um, Caio Giulio Cesare Mussolini, which is like being called uh, Gaius Julius Caesar Mussolini. Hmm. And he was, a, I think, a European parliamentary candidate for um, Fratelli d'Italia. Uh, and uh, he gave a speech in 2019 uh, at a party event on the doctrine of fascism, which is the famous manifesto uh, written by Mussolini together with uh, Giovanni Gentile, uh, the regime's like leading ideologue. Uh, and you know, often you know, in a way, they're quite junior figures. Uh, but uh, also, I mean, you know, the reason there's a reason why the members of the party want to have their selfies taken with these people, and it's because of the surname. Um, but also, actually, I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of kind of um, family trees of this kind in the party. You know, the descendants of the historic leaders who are like still around. There's a very strange bit in Meloni's. Uh, so basically, the, the basically the second most important leader of Fratelli d'Italia is called um, Ignazio La Russa, and he is uh, he he's been around since like the 70s in in like neo-fascist politics, uh, and his middle name is Benito, even though he was born in 1947. And his father was a national fascist party leader in uh, Sicily during the regime, uh, and then an MSI neo-fascist senator in the post-war period. So you know he comes from a, a very like conventional and important fascist family, has been around in neo-fascist politics for like well neo-fascist and then so-called post-fascist politics for uh, fifty years. And in Meloni's memoir, she kind of makes a passing reference to. Uh, Ignazio Benito uh, La Russa, where she refers to him in very violent language, but positively, uh, she says he is the heir to a bloodline of the surest faith. Um, and it's interesting because it's like a very passing mention, you know, it's just a few words, but then within that, it's like a very like fascist way of describing that. Um, it, it, it. Am I hallucinating that the, isn't there a Mussolini that has is like a pop star? Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe I just dreamt that. <laughs> okay. Well, the, um, the, the son was a jazz pianist. Okay. okay also, that's, another, another interesting one is um, what's his name? Uh, one of the great grandsons is a footballer who plays for Lazio and like the, the soccer team who have like a very like uh their fan base has an important fascist element let to be uh let, we might say bolsonaro but bolsonaro is a fan correct <laughs> yeah that, that would make sense um and when when the when this mussolini was uh uh started to play for lazio the times you know the london times had a, a very good headline it was something like you know lazio sign up Mussolini's great grandson to bolster their right wing. So let let's sort of uh, end returning to Maloney. Um, I sort of cut you off, or we didn't explore it deeply enough. Just um, this history that you have uh, cataloged quite well on your Twitter of Maloney just for years. Uh, 
just doing blatant great, great replacement conspiracy theories, throwing in your classic Soros conspiracies. I even saw, and this is very revealing, because if, if you sort of study the far right, you see these markers that usually can indicate, you know, is this person just racist? Is this person just xenophobic? Are they also anti-Semitic? You know, are they all three? And so you sort of see markers that sort of give you indication, right? And I was looking through your thread and I was seeing, okay, great replacement, ding, 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 George Soros, uh, conspiracy, that's a classic, ding, ding, ding. And then I saw that, uh, perhaps not Maloney, but was it someone in her party that she's connected to decrying usury, which is, is something, in my experience, is not 100% of the time uh, sort of an anti-Semitic dog whistle, but a lot of the time it is. So, well, yeah, go, go on that. Well, I mean, like... Um... It was actually Maloney's own um, Twitter, I believe. It was definitely Maloney's social media. I think it was Twitter, not Facebook. Uh, but that, that said, George Soros is a usurer who stands with the... And the, you know, is the left, she said, stands with George Soros, who's a usurer against the Italian people. And, you know, she's often said this stuff, like George Soros is the person who's financing the ethnic substitution. So, like, I think that to say that that is not fascist is just uh, hair splitting like like ob like objectively the, the combination of the conspiracy theory and the claim of um racial destruction and the left allied with finance and so against the like organic people and so on i mean those are basically you know those are fascist ideas so like you know i think i think one of the reasons why the italian case is interesting is like a lot of a lot of the discussion like you know is trump a fascist or is le pen a fascist the the discussion often gets bogged down in this kind of thing of like well is it really like the 30s so i think like it really isn't in the sense of like the level of mass mobilization the level of social violence uh the count the revolutionary threat all that stuff is like obviously much weaker now but what's interesting with the italian case is actually that you have a party that is the heir to fascism you know it has organizational continuity with the you know with the end of the fascist regime so you know those people have over time changed the way they organize uh you know they've adopted more like constitutional means of action you know they don't have like you know violent uh street gangs and so on anymore as their like main way of organizing uh, even if they include some like disreputable figures from that world. But like, you know, over time, they have adopted a more um, constitutional, more sort of media focused, less confrontational uh, way of acting politically. Like I said before, you know, Milani herself is like too young to have seen the terrorism of the 70s and such like. Yet at the same time, the the the, the ideas and the traditions are still alive in the party they mix them with other things but they haven't gone away um so i think you know one one way i'd put that is like um milani's memoir is full of references to uh um uh lord of the rings and the hobbit and and jrr tolkien and tolkien is like uh, very much an influence in the italian uh, far right since at least the 70s uh, and, and part of his appeal is that he's a uh, obviously a kind of pop culture reference and also like you know, Tolkien himself was like a conservative but like obviously not like a fascist um, but you know from his, the way they read him is to is a whole language of like civilizational destruction of uh, of people's rising and falling and dying uh but not just like the way that say oswald spengler in the in the uh um uh decline of the west uh talks about like you know the the twilight of civilizations in their like natural development towards old age and death but rather like an idea of 
the besieged organic community having to fight to defend its roots. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the 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 ethnic substitution, the politics about like uh, birth rates and so on. You know, Meloni often says that Italians are uh, are going extinct. It like conforms to this kind of idea of this like grand civilizational death, uh, but it's also phrased in a slightly kind of folksy way because obviously the novels are are, are novels. Um, so, so I think that's a way in which you can kind of communicate to a kind of very militant base and talk about those issues of like, you know, civilizational threat and the left that wants to destroy civilization. Uh, she, you know, in, she, in her, her speech at Vox, the Spanish far right party in June, she said all this kind of stuff again. Um, but, but at the same time, it kind of fits within uh, a sort of conservative, a conservatism uh, also benefiting from the fact that conservatives internationally have become more fixated on uh, civilizational threat. So, like, if you look at people like obviously Trump and Bannon, but also people like uh, you know Douglas Murray, the Spectator writer, uh, this kind of thing, and, and then the various likes of Viktor Orban and Hungary and so on. So, other more centre right forces, you could say, are talking about these uh, these ideas of like, like racial threat. And, 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 within that, it's, 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 and, and they often extreme. they often point to Italy. What what's sort of interesting is um, if you follow sort of anti these anti immigration far right figures, they're they're they often since the migrant crisis have used like uh, lump videos of. Um, uh, yeah. migrants in Lampedusa to be, you, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll post a video and say, see, there's no more Italians. See, mm-hmm. this is what the, so in what way did the migrant crisis sort of, could you say, did it sort of change Italian politics? It, it obviously it brought immigration to the fore, but did it make it sort of more racial, more sort of more nasty in a way. Yes, I mean it, it did. I mean part of the part of the issue is that, um, I mean the Italy has a uh, considerably smaller uh, population of like of as the French would say a uh, sort of, of immigrant descent than do countries like Britain and France, like. Uh, the the population of like children of of non European immigrants born in Italy until the 1980s is, is quite small, and it's Italian politics uh, hasn't had uh, very big moments of like you know like anti racist movements that have been successful and changed politics and and and, and like I think uh, uh, there's a certain kind of like casual racism and dehumanization of like black and brown people in general which is very widespread in Italian public life and certainly on the on the right. Um, so, and of course, it's also the case that the, uh, you know, while of course, um, Italy uh, had to house uh, a lot of refugees who uh, crossed the Mediterranean, the, the actual number was like much lower than countries like Germany. And uh, I think, you know, the kind of spectacularization of the conflict with the migrant boats sort of isn't isn't only a response to the well, you know it's far from only a response to the real numbers because you know the number of uh, the number of immigrants who arrive in Italy across the Mediterranean each year is probably like let's say like many tens of thousands so obviously the idea of like civilizational threat is like well even apart from <laughs> like on the ground of the numbers alone and that's obviously like a very hysterical perspective. Mm. Never mind the mm-hmm. whole integration, and you, of course, I mean, if uh, you know, I mean, if your uh, if any of your readers like myself are from uh, Irish uh, families, then uh, of course the fact of having often been a nation of emigrants uh, certainly doesn't uh, predispose a a country to being welcoming to immigrants. Uh, in fact, it's very commonplace in Italian politics to counterpose the like good Italian immigrants. So. It's very common to counterpose the good Italian immigrants who went abroad to work and fitted in, unlike the foreigners who come to Italy now who don't. 
And of course, for anyone who knows anything about the way that Italians, and particularly Southern Italians, were treated when they first came to mm. the United States, or indeed mm. France uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, or, or in fact Belgium, uh, where um, um, you know many Italians worked in the mines and suffered terrible mining disasters in addition to some, th this whole perspective of like, oh, Italians were like welcomed as like fellow whites, I mean, is very shaky <laughs> uh, as a reading of history, but it conforms to a certain, yeah, I mean, it conforms to a basically white supremacist perspective. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's a certain contradiction in that. I think you alluded to in your first question, which is that the, 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 the centrality to like, certainly to media of like the, the, there being this like so-called refugee crisis has certainly ebbed, uh, gone away a lot. And yet Milani is leading a party which has a very harsh anti-immigrant uh, perspective and, and yeah, they're doing very well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing is, is that there's a kind of identitarian nationalism, a defense of the so-called like normal family and Christian Europe and so on, which is much more intense than say the Christian Democrats of the sixties and seventies had like, the Christian Democrats in government then were less like chauvinistically Italian nationalist than say the Lega or the Fratelli d'Italia um, are now. Um, so, so family, I, I, am I correct in the brothers of Italy really try to center the, this family? And what's interesting about Maloney is I think a lot of uh, Americans just assume that sort of gay issues, you know, LGBTQ issues or abortion are sort of no longer part of the political landscape in Europe, that the, the entire continent sort of beyond that. But actually, that's not true with her. Can you talk about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's actually kind of, um, you know, obviously with the very grim news in the United States with the reversal of Roe versus Wade, and it's like, that leads to a lot of idealization of the European situation uh, and, and also sort of thing Europe as monolithic. But yeah, I mean, like in in Italy, um, there's a law from 1978 which decriminalizes abortion, but it doesn't guarantee access. So, and in fact, doctors are allowed to be um, conscientious objectors and refuse to carry out abortions. And most... Um, most uh, gynecologists in Italy are conscientious objectors. And in some re regions, particularly a, a little like, I guess you might say, of rural areas in, in red states in the US, um, in, in, you know, in basically poorer southern regions, some of them have like you know 80% plus objection, which means like it can be very hard for women to get an abortion. Some regions also promote, uh, including Le Marquet, which is a, there's a very good article in The Guardian about this, actually. Uh, Le Marquet is a region governed by Fratelli d'Italia. And basically they want like a seven week limit on abortion with a one week compulsory waiting period. So like basically you say you want one and then you have to consider it for a week, which would impose, you know, effectively a six week abortion limit. And obviously... And, 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 and let me just ask, did they justify this in sort of the American red state style of, you know, sort of Bible thumping? Or is it or is it this is a demo, you know, we have this demographic threat, quote unquote, from the uh, immigrants. And that's why we believe this, which, which is more the focus in that uh, justification. <laughs> I think it's less religious because although um, there are certainly elements of overlap with like uh, Christian uh, anti-abortion movements and, and you know where the Fratelli d'Italia has been in power and also the Lega, they've often funded like Christian uh, anti you know anti-abortion movements. But I think it's somehow a bit less um, explicitly evangelical, is how it or or. I mean, even apart from the division between you know, literal evangelicals and Catholics, uh, I, I, yeah, I think it's less Bible thumping and more the race thing. Um, because, um, yeah, I mean, like, Meloni talks a lot about the extinction of the Italian people. Uh, the first, the first uh, 
like point in the program of the party in 2018 was uh, you know, a national policy to boost birth rates. Um, so there's that, but then at the same time, I, there's a certain less, uh, let's say, ideologically zealous way of it promotes this, where it goes kind of like, well, you know, the abortion law was always meant to be combined with measures that would make it easier for women to have uh, a child if they wanted to, like, you know, daycare and this kind of thing. So they say that, but then at the same time, they actually also oppose like job seeker benefits, they oppose the minimum wage and so on. So they, they, in reality, they don't help women in that way either, but they do also like talk about it a bit, you know, like, oh, no one should have to have an abortion because of poverty, which is you know, true. But then really the, the focus of their interventions is just to suppress uh, abortion. Like they say, they don't want to get rid of the formal right to do so, but basically they want to put more uh, more conditions uh, on it. Yeah. And, and for people who don't know, Italy, uh, for a long time, I correct me if I'm wrong, they have, it, I'm not sure if it's true in the latest stats, but for a while, they were sort of known as like the lowest uh, uh, birth rate in, in on the continent, I think, for a long time. It's Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it, it, yeah. It, it, it is true. I mean, it, it is. I mean, um, but you know, I mean, it, it, it is true that uh, the birth rate in Italy is lower than other countries. I mean, that could be for good and bad reasons, of course, because you know, uh, obviously, <laughs> you know, it's uh, uh, well, frankly, like you know, the, the like I mean, uh, I uh, I struggle to 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 uh, care about you know. I mean, the the, the issue for me is. Um, do people, you know, people should be given the opportunity to make the choices they want. Yeah. So yep. whether that's having kids or not. So, um, you know, in yeah. the fact that, you know, the fact that there isn't, you know, free uh, childcare or the fact that, you know, like a lot of women who move out of the labour market then find it very hard to rejoin. And Italy has the lowest uh, level of female employment, I think, in the entire EU, or certainly in the in the well west uh, of uh, Europe. So, I mean, those are obviously, I, I think, those kind of impediments, you know, are, are an issue. But then, yeah, I mean, I, I think basically uh, Fratelli d'Italia's approach is uh, is uh, repressive. But, uh, you know, it's, We'll go back to, I want to finish and just give the audience a, a, a quick lightning overview of their different positions, but you touched on something important. Uh, the, there is a perception of Italy, you know, as a country of machismo. Uh, how historic would, she, would uh, Maloney be if she is elected on uh, September 26th? Uh, is this a did this surprise you that uh, Italian politics, which you know Berlusconi, very famous uh, bunga bunga parties, I believe they were called, you know, it's sort of the tough guy, ladies man thing, Salvini. Is it a surprise to see a woman potentially emerging on top? Mm, I well, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it in contrast with the. Berlusconi thing in that way because I, I I think like there's nothing um, in a way it's it, it, I mean it, it although they're very different parties I mean it is comparable to Thatcherism in the sense that you have a woman who has no feminist policies and yeah. who leads yeah. an, an entirely male uh, in fact you know you know the throughout her entire period as prime minister. Margaret Thatcher didn't have a single uh, female minister. So, you know, I mean, I wouldn't put like an enormous importance on that kind of politics of you know, individual representation or whatever. But like, yeah, I mean, I, I think like the fact that there's no feminist edge makes it easier for her to, uh, I mean, like the one thing that Hillary Clinton said that was kind of true was that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's useful for right-wing parties to be able to foreground women as defenders of patriarchal and, and reactionary 
uh, policies, which in in this case uh, is true. Um, I mean, one thing actually though is that like, you know, and actually for that same reason though, I mean, like if you actually look at the polling for like who voted for Berlusconi, um, you know, he uh, he had very strong. I I, I, I think I'm convinced that firstly that um, Silvio Berlusconi scored much stronger results among housewives than among the general population and even of women over men. So, you know, I think there's a there's it's it's not, you know, necessarily the case that that women are drawn to more progressive or feminist candidates. Although in certain countries we we really can see that, uh, notably in, in Britain and I believe in the United States as well, because of of course there is a certain combination of like um yeah, uh, there is yeah, obviously there are uh, um, um yeah, well yeah there are <laughs> plenty of of uh good reasons for um for women not to uh, not to uh n- not to like uh, these parties and their policies but it, it's uh, far from uh, homogenous let's say i mean I, i'm not sure that it's a, a big factor in the overall dynamic of the vote i i see that she only has one child which i, I don't know Maybe ironic for somebody who's always talking about birth rates, but <laughs> maybe that's maybe is, that's. Uh... There's, I mean, one of the interesting things actually is like um, Meloni said, like Meloni's like you know, party is very focused on like you know children need uh, uh, married and heterosexual parents, and that Meloni herself is not married, so. You know, she's chosen not to, I think. I think it's you know, obviously like perfectly fine for her to choose to do whatever she likes. Of course, but, of course. But then at the same time, it's like, well, why? <laughs> you know, why, if, why are you making these choices for other people then? And I mean, there was, there was actually, you know, t- to his credit, I mean, like Enrico Meta, who's the leader of the Democrats, has led like a very poor and weak campaign. But there was a debate with him and Milani on um, uh, Monday evening, and um, there was a debate. Part of the debate was like, well, can a can a um, can a child have gay parents? And the reason also why this was raised was that last week uh, Fratelli d'Italia called for an episode of uh, Peppa Pig. Do you have it in the United States? I, I think I've heard of it. It's a children's show, yeah. It's a children's show where they're like, you know, anthropomorphic pigs. It's like it's probably it's probably aimed at the same kind of children who would watch like Dora the Explorer or something. I think it's for children of a similar yeah. age. Yeah, I yeah, I've never seen it. I've never mm-hmm. watched lots of things either. But uh, so yeah, I'm not don't have the same cultural reference points as Milani. Mm. But like, you know, they called for an episode of Peppa Pig to not be shown in Italy because it shows a child with two mothers. Um so, um, you know, like, a, a, uh, uh, um, you know, obviously the, the children's show doesn't go into whether it's adopted or, or, or whatever, but like, I mean, so in the debate, um, Meloni uh, said, like, you know, oh, like a child needs two parents. And then a letter says, well, well, why does it matter if they're the same gender or not? And then Milani said, but the important thing is it's just like something that the state and the government shouldn't uh, impose laws on. And then he's like, well, it's you who are doing that. Like, it's it's you who are, like the words he used was, it's like you who are like imposing laws on like love, right? It's like you who's saying like this family unit is the right one. Um so yeah, so, so but I actually think like I, I think like that kind of issue actually her position is probably quite unpopular. Like I, I would say that the the, the idea of uh, adoption by um, like the, the, the idea that adoption by same sex couples is wrong uh, is probably quite uh, unpopular because because also because you know these kind of cultural shifts have already taken place in a lot of Western countries. And, you know, like, obviously, like, you know, Italians watch like Hollywood movies and stuff. So uh, I, I think it's just like a, an impossible, um, you know, they will, uh, 
they will fight that fight. But I think, you know, I think it's, uh, it's probably, and actually I'd probably say it's probably even something they could give up uh, within the logic of their development as a party. Just for the benefit of uh, listeners, and I don't want to keep you been super generous, but let's just quickly, I'll just go through the issue list and you just sort of tell me. Taxes, what do they want? More or less? Less. Okay. Uh, for them, like, it's easy to think, oh, yeah, like, you know, like when Trump talks about like bringing back jobs and something, mm. so you get this kind of commentary which like says, oh, well, you know, they're the party for the working classes now. But actually, like, I mean, in the coalition, the right wing parties are all in coalition together. They're running together. They have a common platform. So the Labour says 15% flat tax rate. Uh, Berlusconi says 23 and Fratelli d'Italia say, well, somewhere in between. So they want to make tax cuts which will basically reduce the state's budget by about 100 billion euros a year and also make the tax system vastly less progressive. Like, it will be a huge handout to the wealthiest. And Fratelli d'Italia's position on like how to, uh, how to create jobs is tax cuts for people who employ new staff and also to strip back environmental regulations so that Italian industry can compete better with China. Which is like a really delusional uh, idea, frankly. So, and I, I was researching this interview. I was seeing, uh, I think, some uh, basically a banker on on Twitter complaining about how they don't want any cuts. The ECB has sort of been very generous and sort of he he was saying subsidizing these massive Italian deficits for years, and they're they're not planning any tightening of the belt is that true as well um well i mean the the thing is is that the um you know italy has uh, almost uh if not exactly 150 percent of gdp uh public debt so that's you know built up over a very long time and it particularly expanded during the 1980s also in the initial period when they switched from having their own currency to being part of the uh, European monetary system, which prepared the way for the euro, basically the effect was to make it like Italy had a very expensive currency and lost control over monetary tools. So its debt soared. So now you have these kind of periodic bailouts from the European Central Bank and so on but which also give Italian governments very little uh, wiggle room in terms of their choices. And in fact, uh, Italian governments since the early 1990s have consistently run um, primary um, budget surpluses, which means that they uh, spend less than they take in tax. So basically austerity. Uh, And the idea has always been like, oh, yeah, we should like spend less and then the debt will go down. And it persistently doesn't because growth is so poor. Uh, in fact, you know, Italy in 2019, before the pandemic, had a smaller GDP than in 1999 when it joined the euro. So although the euro isn't the only factor, uh, it's had very long term stagnation. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem is, is that the the high debt and its um, vulnerability means that uh, it would be very difficult for any Italian government to uh, to to do anything major to kickstart growth. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, like Meloni's party has basically said, you know, we don't want to make any big changes to Draghi's, uh, Mario Draghi, the technocratic previous leader, we don't want to make big changes to his um, economic plans. You know, they're very much trying to like steady the ship and present, present themselves as moderate and so on. But I think with the the rising uh, crisis, uh, you know, the coming recession and also the particularly the uh, rising uh, gas bills and so on, I think will be very quickly put that to the test. Now, now there, be, despite, and I've seen protests over the gas bills in Italy, I saw a video of that a few weeks ago, I think, uh she is pro ukraine correct oh yes very much so she's very strongly emphasized this um yeah i mean um it's it's part of their party they they want to be seen as a responsible ally and a nato supporter and so on right Uh, i mean so yeah i mean that's also a potential division within the coalition because salvini is perceived to be decidedly more 
uh, uh, not like you know, literally uh, you know, on the Russian side, uh, but certainly like insisting like, oh, maybe the sanctions are a bad idea and we should rethink them and this kind of thing. But he's also suing somebody, right, for saying uh, Liga is funded by Russia, correct? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, I mean, the, the slightly comical thing about that is, uh, I mean, they they didn't actually say that. They they said, uh, I mean, f- frankly, like the the party is blatantly funded by Russian. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So, uh, no, uh, so on. The only question sorry, really, go ahead. It, it's somewhat more questionable whether Fratelli d'Italia is funded by Russia because, or, or it has been at least in the past. Because uh, Paul, uh, not Paul Volker, it's anything to say, uh, Kurt Volker, Kurt Volker, the uh, former um, yeah. Kurt Volker, the uh, former U.S. ambassador to NATO, he said that he had heard this, so that was a big controversy uh, today. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in 2017, um, uh, Salvini announced a formal alliance between um, the Lega and the United Russia, the pro-Putin party. So I think there's really very little doubt. Pretty bizarre thing to do. Um, and so on immigration, she I've seen that she wants, uh, you know, it's sort of the classic tropes of why are we giving the apartments to the immigrants and stuff like that. She wants uh, to sort of da- downrank the benefits. That I- is that correct, or w- just what is their immigration agenda? Well, they talk about. Um so one issue is that um, there's been a, 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 an approach on the centre left for a while, which is to call for something called jus soli, like which means like you know right of the soil, which is like basically anyone born in Italy would automatically be entitled to Italian citizenship. That doesn't exist at the moment. So the children of uh, non-Italians uh, um, aren't necessarily entitled to, to citizenship. Um, and she's always opposed this, but she proposes this kind of thing, which is like they would be able to get it like at the end of their schooling. Um, so it has a kind of the idea is like it's through like you become Italian through like integration, uh, but that you're not like entitled to, to citizenship. Uh, but at the same time, she's called called for like very harsh means of repressing immigration into Italy. So she's called for a naval blockade, even during the current campaign, uh, a naval blockade against migrant boats in the Mediterranean. And then also um, has even floated the idea that European countries could send troops into the uh, ports in North African countries in order to directly control uh, migration. Um, so, I mean, that that's very like, um, I think, yeah, obviously that's uh, one of the more shocking and awful proposals because you know that it's very easy to see how that could like the kind of de- I, uh, des- much as when Salvini was interior minister, the kind of desire for like spectacular displays of taking a tough stance mm-hmm. could indeed uh, kill hundreds or thousands of people. Is deportation a big issue in in Italian politics? I mean, they they don't propose to um, they don't propose to like repatriate people who've already arrived because they're not oh. allowed. Oh, the, is that because Frontex you know, they handle it, right? Yeah, although the, oh, the, the qualification put on that is that um, uh, in Greece uh, there are a lot of pushbacks across the border. Mm-hmm. Like, there's been lots of cases of Frontex agents and Greek police. Um, taking migrants who've already arrived uh, back to Turkey or even just like dumping people in the sea and forcing them to go to make their own way back or or sink. Uh, so sink is of course the wrong way uh, to 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 you know leaving people to drown. Um, so um, but I, I think in, in Italy like um, the 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 deportation isn't really discussed so much as the idea of like blocking the Mediterranean. So, so uh... Was it cynical when Maloney, uh, she she made international headlines a, a few weeks ago for uh, tweeting out a pretty graphic event 
and mm. sort of bringing this migration issue to the fore. Could you just speak about that? So, like, um, what she uh, posted on on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram was a clip which had gone up on the site of uh, Il Messaggero, which is a newspaper in Rome, uh, which shows a rape uh, of a Ukrainian woman by a man from uh, Guinea. Um, and, you know, it's a security camera footage and the faces are blurred, uh, yet um, the victim herself said, uh, you know, told uh, reporters that, you know, she had been recognized due to the video and that the case drew a publicity uh, which she hadn't wanted because, you know, obviously it turned a lot of attention on her. Um, and, you know, it was obviously an extremely uh, awful and traumatic experience for her. Uh, and um, the, um, the, 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 um, so the various social media companies, you know, Facebook slash Instagram and Twitter actually took down Melanie's post and then she got a lot of criticism and then she basically said, well, the left don't want to face up to this reality because they've always defended mass immigration and they don't want to accept the consequences. And then she like, even after the initial sort of outbreak of scandal, she then brought it up again uh, more than a week later at a uh, election rally in uh, in Perugia, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, she clearly felt that the left wing and reaction against her was useful to her. And obviously she couldn't have cared less about the uh, woman who was the actual victim uh, because she just used it to make, uh, you know, Meloni just used the, uh, the rape in order to, to make uh, racist propaganda. And of course, it's very typical of, of her party and also of Salvini's yeah. uh, to, yeah. to directly associate crime. Yeah, with, uh, I mean, the, the, the take I was seeing, and I'm sure that it was also being uh, deployed on Italian Twitter was, hey, look, the woke left, they don't care about the rape. They don't care about it. They just care about being politically correct. That was the very convenient mm -hmm. framing that they had, and I it, it seemed quite uh, quite calculated. Yeah, yeah because yeah. in the, in the, I mean in the in the uh, rally I mentioned the one which was like more than a week after the initial uh, the the video uh, the first time, Meloni in her speech in Perugia she said in the rock paper scissors of the, the left uh, a immigrant wins over a raped woman. So obviously that's a, it's a really harsh and schematic uh, way of putting it. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it's of course implausible that, you know, her party as, as like some sort of defender of the victims of sexual violence is, 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 is uh, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, most uh, sexual violence is like, you know, within the family and, and so on. So, so like, you know, I mean, I think people who have actually fought around that issue, like the Nonuna di Meno, who have had some very large uh, marches against uh, the gender violence in, in the recent years, you know, I mean, obviously they don't share her perspective, but then it's just a way of, it's just a way of like throwing the left's issues back against it. You know, it's like, oh, you say you're feminists, but why don't you care about this woman? Uh, even though Melanie's own propaganda has, uh, you know, has been openly criticised by the by the victim herself. So yeah, I mean, I think I think um, it's it, it's part. I mean, I th I think to take a, a very different example, but of, of a, a somewhat analogous thing, is this kind of thing of like imputing crime to immigration and it being like a foreign influence. I mean, like, I think, like, you know, a lot of uh, people internationally would think, like, maybe uh, tax evasion in Italy is not a phenomenon that needs to be imported from the outside, right? Yeah. But Meloni says it's non-EU, there's this expression in Italian, extra comunitari, literally means, like, non-EU citizens, but basically it's a euphemism for black people. And 
she says it's the it's these people who are setting up businesses and not paying tax. So she says that when they set up businesses in Italy, they should have to pay like a big deposit up front to show mm. that they're <laughs> basically guarantee of their taxes, <laughs> which like which like Europeans slash you know, effectively whites wouldn't uh, have to. So so yeah, it's just this way of you take this issue, which you know, like uh, you know, in general, Fratelli d'Italia is a party which calls for less tax, tax inspections. It's this, it calls it fiscal peace. It's like we need to stop the overbearing state, which is like forcing on this tax and people and overwhelming them with forms and bureaucracy and so on. And uh, I would say there's a considerable tax evader element to the base and membership of Fratelli d'Italia. Uh, but yeah, but then they just turn it into this like issue of, of of race and migration in a way which you know is functional to their propaganda, but obviously kind of uh, obviously kind of visible as an analysis of the problem. Yeah, there certainly was no tax evasion or uh, mafia crime before uh, 2013 in Italy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so it, it seems like everybody says it's a done deal. She's she's going to uh, win this thing. Um, and I, I, based on the uniformity of that opinion, I don't doubt it. But that sort of leaves us with a question I want to end on, which is what has become of the Italian left? Um, I really don't know that much about the PD as I think they're known. Uh, but I, I wonder if it seems like that the, the, the uh, whether you like the term or not, let's just use it in scare quotes, the migrant crisis was uh, so enlivening sort of for the right in Europe. Um, and that in a lot of countries, it really was a blow to that the the traditional left parties uh is that why the left in italy has sort of been down and out for such a long time that's one thing and then also the i'm going de Maio. what happened to him what happened five star just tell me about <laughs> five star in the left what happened okay well so one thing is is i mean i think the um I, I'm I'm unconvinced that the migrant uh, crisis, so-called, is like a, a primary factor in the decline of the left. Or actually, I think it plays out in a in a in a in a complicated way in the sense that I don't think it's uh, only. Um, but I mean, I, I I don't think it only. Um, I don't think the problem is 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 just like oh well they were too liberal and and wealthy sure. because. Also, because when the um, from um, twenty sixteen to eighteen, so basically before the last election, the democratic interior minister Marco Miniti was yeah. very hardline in repressing yeah. migrants, in outsourcing the repression of it to mm -hmm. Libya and so on. So, but then I think kind of the thing is like it's a bit like if you're on the centre left. I mean, even as like, okay, so one, like, obviously the human effects of that were bad. And yeah, actually the the number uh, did decline very significantly before the, before the last, before 2018. So you know, I, I don't know the exact number, but let's say the number of migrants arriving in Italy across the Mediterranean declined from something like 150,000 a year to the like low tens of thousands. But, but I think I think the problem is is like even aside from like you know people who want to suppress the numbers, they they just they they also like want the the racism right like mm -hmm. they. Mm -hmm. But then I think like the the problem the Democrats have is that because they've presided over such consistently poor um, economic outcomes for. In fact, even for like national GDP, but like particularly for young people and low earners and so on, is that they have like very badly eroded their own base. So if you actually look at the the total vote for the centre right coalition, so called, like the Fratelli d'Italia, Lega, Berlusconi, 
their like total vote share is like barely different from what it was like 30 years ago like the, it has rallied behind relatively more radical parties within that coalition but like the the number of switches from left to right isn't that big the the, the main phenomenon is that the center left vote has has declined uh, because of you know basically working class turnout has fallen a lot and also you know like italy in the 70s 80s had like ele- general elections with, with like consistently like more than 90 percent turnout but wow. it's now surprising if it was 70 wow. percent and that, that that fall is concentrated among uh or you know relatively higher among working class people and it, i think it's an important reason for the decline of the left because it's like the democrats themselves carried out a lot of the main uh, austerity measures of like neoliberal counter reforms in the labor market like making it easier to sack people this kind of thing and then a certain yeah sort renzi of, was a lot like macron he was you know, a very similar sort of yeah and he explicitly modeled himself on him as well as on tony blair of course so i mean so the the thing with five star is very contradictory because five star claim to be neither left nor right but uh broadly drew five star uh its first period of growth drew more on former left-wing voters than former right-wing ones and uh despite as i said earlier being in very odd coalitions and swapping partners and so on now five star is very much perceived as of the center left and probably in fact as more left-wing than the democrats so its campaign this time so led by giuseppe conte who was prime minister from 2018 to 21 so conte led both the five-star Lega government and the five-star democrat government even though he didn't actually join the five-star movement until after uh, the second one but yeah so conte is now the five-star leader and he's basically run his election campaign on defense of job seeker benefits which were introduced by five stone 2019 so basically like if you're looking for work you get like a 700 euro a month payment which hadn't existed before so yeah he's defending that and also calling for a nine euro an hour minimum wage which actually currently doesn't have a minimum wage so despite its record and it's like slightly odd mix of figures within it i think that a lot of the left-wing electorate will still vote for five star this time and it's like during the opening weeks of the campaign at least its poll numbers uh rose considerably so you know it will still do it will still do enormously worse than 2018 but let's say in 2018 it got like 32 percent in some polls it fell as low as like nine or ten percent and then now it's probably going to be like i would expect it to score like slightly above 15 percent so you know they are strong in the south and in a lot of the constituencies in the south i would expect they will win because they'll be the main challenger to the far right uh and basically to the left of that there's a very little or rather there are several small parties one of which is called unione popolare like popular union which is led by luigi de magistris who was mayor of naples throughout the 2010s and you know a lot of the sort of former the small sort of heirs to italian communism are in that uh, but i would be uh, surprised if it's able to enter parliament there's also some sort of soft left and green figures who are uh, allied to the democrats as well but yeah i mean i think overall the problem is like uh for some like you know stereotypically if you imagine an italian who is 40 years old and struggles to find regular employment and live with their parents which is very common for even italians in their 30s and 40s uh what experience would they have that makes them think oh yeah like the left is going to stand up for me or you know they can get things done or like politics and solidarity and organizing is the thing that's going to make my life better because i think the, the problem is other than the actual record of the democrats the other problem is like the other kinds of mobilization or like trade unionism and so on have quite have only quite sporadic signs of life and success so it's very hard to frame 
politics in general in terms of like, yes, organized labor can do stuff or yes, the state can intervene to shift the balance in the economy or something just because it's, right. it's something that's far from people's right. experience. Like it's something right. that happened. So you know, to draw, I mean, I can, I can only draw, uh, it's easy for me to draw a British comparison, which is that in Britain, the National Health Service is universally recognised as mainly the creation of the Labour Party. And it's something that like everyone knows what it is, everyone uses it, and its existence like embodies a kind of a certain principle, right, which is like free public service. So even though the Labour Party may do many awful things and, and even undermine the NHS itself, it's, it, it can always kind of use that to be like, this is what our party basically is. And I think in Italy, it, you'd, be, you'd struggle to find a similar example, mm. like where people are like, oh yeah, like if only we had this thing but extended to other parts of the economy or other mm. services. Thing. It just doesn't really exist. So it, it it's like it's I mean it's a bit tautological in a way, but it's kind of like because it's like the fact that things have got so bad already also makes it hard to see how they would get better again. Yeah, there seems to be a pessimism in uh I, I could be wrong, but I, I that's the sense I get. And 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 a sort of there's a sense of um decline and pessimism that can be very fertile ground for sort of right wing thought, you know, restoration, et cetera. Um, I, I did bring up DeMaio. Or I, am I saying oh, his yeah. name wrong? Is that his name yeah. wrong? Yeah, look, no, it, it, it is right. I just forgot. Uh, Luigi DeMaio actually left the five star movement. Oh, my uh, God, uh, I'm embarrassed. And he had his own party which is called Impegno Civile, I think it's called. I think it's, is it? <laughs> Impegno Civile, yeah. So it's civil uh, commitment. But the reason why I forget the name is it's like, it's not even polling like 1%. Wow. There's like there's no chance that he'll, uh, he'll be elected. I, uh, so he adopted a much more, uh, he's actually like, so for, basically, Five Star and the Democrats are not running as allies, even though they have in some recent regional elections. Whereas uh, De Maio actually is with the Democrats, but basically has no profile. Because the problem is, is it's kind of like, he's like completely cut himself off, even from the notional, like anti-establishment, whatever, a movement of the Five Star claim to embody, yet also like among like kind of centrist voters they'd still see him as like a, a quite ridiculous and unreliable figure. So I think there's very little space for him. I just had to bring him up because I, Demi, DeMaio's story illustrates why I always love paying attention to European politics because um, I'm one of those Americans who wishes we had a parliamentary system, in part <laughs> just because the, you know, in America, it's just Coke and Pepsi forever, right? There's no creative destruction. In Italy, that you have a, fight, a party like Five Star, which was created by a comedian and then was led in a election by, what was he, 32 years old, DeMaio at the time. And he was, I do he wasn't a college graduate. I think he like worked at a restaurant or something. But the the idea that you could have a party, do, you know, have top results in a national election led by like, you know, your sibling who who's a who was a server at a restaurant is so uh, inconceivable to American uh, um the American mind, I've always uh, thought it, that was extraordinary, right? Yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, I think uh, it's kind of a, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, like in a certain phase of the Five Star Movement, they were very insistent on the idea, which is like, what you need to do is kick out all the career politicians yeah. and bring in people with no experience. And because they have no experience, they're like more like real and honest. 
and you know, like I mean, I don't doubt in a certain way, um, you know, some of the you know the the, uh, the people had like good intentions or whatever, but like I mean, obviously, I, I, and I would say because of their lack of like political acumen and experience and ideas, and then, and then actually, you know, it's like you know people who aren't like oh yeah, like they've been like a political organizer at some in some other way, like you know whatever, like an environmentalist or a trade unionist or something, but really just like random people like they were you know, very quickly like sucked in and spat out by like the uh, stronger parties and the and you know the the italian civil service and so on so so yeah I mean, like a lot of them um but yeah I, I mean at the same time like in general it's a it would be a very good thing also for parties of the left to be able to um you know it, I mean, to, to have more uh, people who are not necessarily uh, not only not career politicians, but also people who are like, you know, people who didn't necessarily like, you know, uh, have like the highest education or the yeah. best or whatever. So, so you know, I mean, I, I think there's a certain uh, uh, way of talking, like there's a certain way in which they were dismissed by uh, the center left at the time when they were on the rise, you know, I, I basically I think like when Five Star was on the rise, and then a bunch of center left politicians and technocrats said, "Well, you're all idiots because you don't have a degree." I mean, I think that probably improved their popular support. The, uh, yeah, the sense. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, cut you off. Yeah, I mean the, the the other interesting thing about it, and it, and and from a, I don't know how closely you follow American politics, but it, now that I think of it, it has a very Andrew Yang sort of. We're not of the left, not of the right, and 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 the interesting thing that's fascinating is Five Star is like run on an app, right? <laughs> Where the <laughs> the members get to vote. It's it's all fascinating, but I don't want to take any more of your time. So let's finish by just stepping back. Let's just assume Maloney's going to win this. And this is going to sort of be like the Italian right speak. You know, we're, we finally fully got the reins. So, like you mentioned earlier, the Sweden Democrats, who almost, uh, pro- to me, more alarmingly, like, I guess they literally come out of, like, neo-Nazis in Sweden in the 1990s. Um, they just had a very good result for themselves in the Swedish election, they came in number two, and the word is that uh, they've taken enough of the vote where what previously was the tradition where all the other Swedish parties would say, we're not going to make a coalition with you, that that now they're basically going to have to bring them into government. That's scary. So where do you put Maloney in this context? I mean, is she more extreme? Is it more alarming than the Sweden Democrat result? And and and, and just how would you contextualize this more broadly? Well, I think that the um, the Italian thing is much worse than the Swedish one also simply because Italy is a much more important uh, country than Sweden. Uh, uh, <laughs> frankly, I mean, I mean, um, in in terms of like, you know, in, in, literally in terms of its like size and population. Well, you're real, you're really offending my Swedish listeners. Yeah, you're, now, you're so. your first, episode, your first episode, <laughs> we're going to like tank your Swedish numbers. But yeah, I, yeah, but I mean, the thing is, is that Georgia Milani has uh, a considerably greater uh, international profile. I mean, she's actually the leader of the so-called. European conservatives and reformists, of which Sweden Democrat is uh, are also a member. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, th- I think actually the thing I I would say I find most disturbing about the entire Italian election cycle, also compared to you know when Salvini was doing well, or even actually compared to Berlusconi, is that I think the soft touch treatment that Milani has received in international media. And the way in which her ascent is basically being prepared for and accepted is troubling because it confirms the argument. I mean, frankly, it confirms the argument I made in my New York Times article, which is that the barriers between the old centre right um, with Christian Democrats and Gaullists and 
uh, British Tories and so on, and with parties of a fascist tradition are uh, breaking down. They are that they, they are ever more openly willing to associate with them. Certainly, of course, the Trump Republican Party somehow provided the glue uh, between the two things. And, you know, I mean, in reality, Fratelli d'Italia is a party that's supported by about 25% of Italians, you know, maybe we'll get 30, uh, on a two thirds turnout, right? Like, it's not like the overwhelming will of mm. the Italian people. But then it's very widely portrayed in international media as like, well, this is, you know, this is what the Italian people want, so therefore you should accept it. And also this kind of, um, uh, this determination to kind of like trivialize the fascist thing by making it a matter of history. So I, I think it's a bit like the, the thing which is like, oh, well, you know, there was an article in the Financial Times last week, which I thought was really poor, which was kind of like, well, um, Meloni in 1996, when she was 19, praised Benito Mussolini, but now she says she wants to stick with the EU and NATO. And it's like, yeah, but like the MSI supported NATO starting in 1951, like neo-fascist. Like she was in a punk band in college, you know. Yeah, so so like it, it's, it, it, the thing is the problem, like obviously they're, they're not like entirely unrelated things, but the fact that she is a racist who advocates great replacement theory is worse than the fact that she praised Mussolini when she was a teenager. And like to 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 collapse the one thing into the other is to trivialize the problem. And I think like people basically have a hard time. Uh, well, I say people. I think like centrist media in anglophone countries have basically a hard time recognizing that racism exists. So uh, in, in this uh, instance, certainly. So so in fact, also in fact, I think it's kind of a bit telling that you know maybe like newspapers who like would you know, make some sort of like uh, rhetorical concession to like, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter or like uh, the reaction to like, you know, police killings of, of black people even in Britain. But actually then when they talk about like Italy, they just like immediately trivialize and ignore the issue of racism. So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's it's that that's something I I, I find a, a little disturbing, but yeah because I because I think frankly like um, even the uh, more critical approaches to Meloni in like liberal media are heavily focused on the Russia issue and like oh like is she really on side and you know maybe like Salvini is less reliable than her which you know I think is you know, certainly right to explore and talk about and certainly there were people from Fratelli d'Italia who did side with Vladimir Putin uh, including uh, in a certain period uh, Georgia Maloney herself but then uh, yeah I, I think the problem is kind of like uh, it, you know in my original article for New York Times I basically said uh, she is using the insistence that she will maintain Italy's foreign alliances in order to pursue a reactionary agenda at home and that's basically what's happening. Um, so yeah, so I, I, and I think like, you know, I mean, I think uh, it has a contaminating effect on, on all politics and it shows that, you know, I mean, in, um, I mean, okay, so like Italy was probably in a way the first because in the 1990s, Berlusconi brought the Lega and MSI as it then was, neo-fascists into his coalition. The first Berlusconi government in 94 was the first time the neo-fascists were in the government. And since then, they've come back. Uh, but this time, the Fratelli d'Italia is the biggest party on the right, and the other ones are the junior partners. That's also kind of what the Swedish thing points towards, right? Like the Sweden Democrats are already bigger than the moderates, the, the centre-right party. So maybe they won't lead the government, but they're definitely on their way. And, you know, I think in lots of countries, we can see um, that parties that were once considered anathemized and unacceptable are being welcomed into broader alliances. But 
the parties who think that they can like uh, control them are wrong because basically all they're doing is you know it's like in the Swedish one it's like basically like uh, all of the other right-wing parties and even to some extent the social democrats uh, tried to adopt parts of what the far right say and like you know talk a bit more about the fact that yeah like immigrants cause lots of crime and this kind of stuff but then really the, the effect is just you know are people going to vote for the lame copy or are they going to vote for the original and then in every single election the swedish democrats the far right have have increased their vote so so yeah i think i think there's a lot of like pandering uh, to these forces a lot of like pretense that they represent what like so-called ordinary people really think and and that is just like a, a, a massive concession to to the things they say which are uh, hateful and false I, I think I think what you said is absolutely correct uh, as far as the difference with Sweden and and come to think of it really obviously you've had Orban and Hungary but that's sort of in that eastern and and Poland obviously and that but that's sort of in that Eastern European sphere but as far as Western Europe Germany you know Sweden France Spain Italy. This is sort of, I mean, it, this is sort of their big chance that they've been waiting for now. I mean, I mean, they've been waiting a long time, but they, there was a, some predictions like during the, again, quote unquote, migrant crisis that it was going to happen then. But, you know, through the mass machinations of Italian politics, it was sort of delayed. But now we're finally seeing it. And for for parties to put in a broader context like AFD in Germany, which I believe has actually thankfully fallen off a, a, quite a bit, I think, partially because um, with COVID, and this was sort of the hope, you know, uh, you, people sort of looked for a person like Merkel, who maybe they didn't just agree with on everything, but was competent, you know. They, the, the nightmare with Trump was you're going to have this game show host and there's going to be a pandemic. And then you really want like Michael Bloomberg or like actual like or Elizabeth Warren, like an actual policy person. We have this, you know, mentally deranged game show host is like a nightmare. So, but AFD in Germany and Le Pen's uh, the national rally, this is they are. I assume looking at this sort of salivating as this is our time. Is that sort of the way that these other far right parties are viewing this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing is, is that, you know, at the start of the pandemic, all of these parties like took quite a hit and probably didn't know quite what to say because it, like probably a, a, a sizable minority of their own base had like conspiracy theorist attitudes. So that made it hard for them to position to carry out their general operation of like normalizing themselves while still pandering to their own supporters. So in each case, you know, Le Pen or Maloney, whatever, in each case they kind of like made a sort of nod and a wink to the no vaxxers, but without ever quite agreeing with them. You know, kind of saying like, oh, like, you know, we why is there no investigation of the origin of the disease? And like why are we doing these lockdowns when we don't know and is the vaccine safe and all this kind of stuff so just like as a general skepticism but without like quite saying like oh it's a pandemic but but i think the thing is the political moment has moved on a lot from that like you know, in the italian election like we're not talking about like healthcare or the pandemic at all really i mean just the 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 economic recovery thing but like I mean, I think I think the problem is, is like basically Europe is headed into like a very severe recession, worse than the previous one. And while in the early 2010s, you know, the previous pandemic in lots of countries, you could say there was like rival left and right populist movements trying to exploit the decline of the old parties. Right. Like if you think of like, you know, Podemos or Syriza or France and Sumise and, and so on. In lots of cases, there were these left-wing parties with like anti-austerity messages who enjoyed a brief rise of support. But you'd have to say that now, compared to say, uh, let's say compared to five years ago, 
the left is much weaker relative to the far right and the far right is much more likely to benefit from this situation uh and i think like even despite the embarrassing links to putin and stuff i think they will be able to mobilize around the um uh you know the gas prices issue and stuff especially if you know a lot of their base are like small businesses and so on um i don't i mean actually i think the irony is actually that italy is one of the countries where the contradictions of that will come to the head most quickly because Meloni is going to lead the government through an extremely turbulent period. Uh, so, I mean, and also actually, if you look at the um, if you look at the polls of the the the, the voters of Fratelli d'Italia are heavily opposed to sanctions against Russia. So, I think it would actually be quite difficult for her to to handle those contradictions. You know, no matter how much she wants to like show a moderate face or whatever. Yeah, I'm glad we I'm glad we ended it on that silver lining because uh, <laughs> because it, this is a very dark subject. And I was just about to say that, um, you know, th- this is a dark time. I mean, especially in America. D- don't get me started. Um, but there are signs that this, you know, she <laughs> she might be really bad at this. And. Uh, you know, one thing I thought of, I don't know if you watched the French. Did you watch the French um, debates, the, the last Le Pen-Macron debate? Uh, yes, I did. To me, if if things go in a more hopeful direction, it will be sort of like that. Because I've always seen those Le Pen-Macron debates as, as exemplifying, uh, like, it's sort of the moment of truth. And obviously, I'm no expert on France, and people have all sorts of issues with Macron, right? Um, But what we saw was beyond, once you got beyond sort of the race baiting and the, the immigrant bashing, when they got to a debate forum, you know, three hours and the topic was, you know, whatever, pension reform and X, Y, and Z. She just didn't have the sub- subject, uh, the, the substance, you know, mm-hmm. and she, and that's why she lost because she was exposed. Uh, and, and that's, that might be our saving grace is that these, these figures, they can, they can get real momentum on sort of the emotional appeals, but a lot of the time they just don't have the, the, there's no meat, there's no substance, there's no policy ideas in in the way that um, lead to long-term success. And so that's (laughs) that's what I'm hoping for. Um, Please, Please plug your forthcoming book, which sounds amazing, please, and tell everybody uh, where they can find your work. And if you have any comments on my rosy scenario, please. <laughs> yeah, well, so my book is called Mussolini's Grandchildren, and it's uh, available from, I think it comes out in March, but uh, hopefully we can release some bits of it before. Uh, and it's with Pluto Press. So if you search David Broder, Mussolini's grandchildren, uh, then you should be able to find it. And basically, it's a it's a, a, a short book about who Fratelli d'Italia are, what their origins are in post-war neo-fascism, and how uh, the people who were defeated in 1945, you know, managed to keep their political movement going and become a, a mainstream uh, force. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, so. Um, I otherwise I write for uh, Jacobin and uh, I'm the Europe editor there, uh, but also sometimes you can find my writing on the New Statesman and uh, uh, if you can read Italian, I also write for Internazionale. So yeah. Well, David, I just want to thank you once again, and I think uh, this is going to be a really useful deep dive for those uh, political freaks like me that they love this stuff. So thank you so much. Have a, have a great day. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. It's very enjoyable to talk about. The problem is not the derby Italia-Francia, the mondiali, that, for other reasons, we see as excuses.
Il problema è che la nostra storia...